Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. everyone for coming um, early on a Monday morning of the week before Thanksgiving. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andre Bratko, who doesn't pronounce his name quite like that, but that's, that's close. Um, he's from the University of Ljubljana, which isn't pronounced quite like that, but that's close, um, in, in Slovenia, which probably is not even close. <laughs> um, uh, so he, he does many things. He, um, he works at a company called Clico, so Clico Software, uh, which specializes in mobile location-based services. Um, but he also is getting a PhD in, in computer science, um, in particular machine learning. Um, uh, and he, you'll be giving two talks today, right? One, the, the, the one that I think we're, we're most <laughs> interested in is his, his recent work on spam filtering, which I'll describe in just a second. Uh, but he also has done more, more general text classification kinds of, of research. Um, the, the spam filtering research is particularly interesting because uh, for two reasons. First, it's interesting to me. It's, it's using a compression-based approach. So as, as some of you know, I've previously written um, uh, some commentaries on, on previous compression-based approaches to, to, to text classification. And I should make it very clear my criticisms were of the specific uh, work that was done and not of the approach in general, which obviously, in, especially with these results, is extremely promising. Um, these results are especially interesting for another reason. So the Trek, for the first time, last week um, ran an evaluation of different spam filters, um, a, very, a very good evaluation on multiple corpora with blind data sets, um, everything you know, very well done for the first time, which in spam filtering is very hard to do, um, and by a substantial margin, Andre won. So we're very excited to have him come tell us, tell us what he did. So what's the topic of the second talk? Uh, the, the topic of the second talk is exploiting structural information for document categorization. Um, I'm not sure. So does this work? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. OK. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using compression models for spam filtering. And all this is in the context of the evalu evalu evaluation of this year's uh, track, spam track. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation we had uh, coming into Trek, and specifically we wanted to try something a little bit different than what is usually used. And usually, most filters that we've come across simply split the text into a bag of words representation and, and learn of that. So I'm going to say a couple of words about what we perceive as uh, limitations of this approach um, that seem especially severe for spam filtering. Um, so to overcome these limitations, we experimented with modeling uh, text as a simple sequence of characters using adaptive statistical data compression algorithms. And I'm going to show you just how these algorithms can be applied to text classification. Uh, I'm going to have a rather ra large results section. And this will include the official evaluation, or, or a summary of the official evaluation at TREC, as well as some preliminary experiments that we did before actually submitting the filters, and also some follow-up experiments on uh, the robustness of this method to noise, which um, seems like a reasonable explanation about why this should um, perform well in, in general. Now, if I'll have time for this, um, I'll also present a couple of visualizations of the, classification of the classifier, which show some interesting patterns that the classifier is able to pick up in the text. So most t text mining methods uh, in general, and spam, filtering, spam filters in particular, uh, work on the classical bag of words representation, which is very practical. You can plug it into, or you can use virtually any machine learning algorithm on top of that. But it has a number of drawbacks for spam filtering, and I've listed just a few. So for example, it's pretty hard to model non-textual features, such as various header fields, or URLs, or email addresses. You'd usually need some sort of special parsing to do that. It's also hard to handle, or practically impossible to handle, punctuation patterns. And these are generally thought to be useful in spam filtering. And uh, a point that I'd really like to emphasize is that um, tokenization, um, tokenization is a very uh, vulnerable step uh, that can easily, easily be exploited by spammers in order to uh, evade filtering. Uh, to simply substituting a character in a, in, in a word will produce a totally different feature. So what we wanted to do is to try a classifier that would 
skip the whole pre-processing and tokenization steps and work on character sequences. So for our purposes, a document is a simple sequence of characters. And what we're after is a model that would be able to evaluate the probability of a given document. So using the chain rule, we can split that up by characters. And um, in order to make the, the estimation prob problem tractable, um, we use the, the normal assumption that the information source generating the message has a limited memory and that it's a Marco source. So each subsequent character will only depend on k previous characters or the context. Now the algorithms we actually used were uh, developed in, in, in the field of data compression, and I'm going to get to those in, in just a second. Uh, and the reason of this is pretty obvious. There's this intimate relationship between probability and data compression. Being able to predict the next character in a sequence allows us to construct uh, efficient codes. So there's a whole family of, of data compression algorithms that um, makes use of this uh, relationship. And um, all of these algorithms basically build Marco model of information sources. And they solve quite a number of, of problems uh, associated with such models that we also had to deal with uh, for Trek. For example, they use variable order models. So they, they implicitly include this bias versus variance trade-off. Um, they adapt the order of the model as the amount of data um, becomes sufficient to, to use a higher order model. Uh, they also solve the zero frequency problem, or they achieve reliable uh, probability estimates by using smoothing methods that are very similar to those used in uh, natural language modeling. And finally, I'd like to point out that these algorithms are efficient, because efficiency is pretty important in data compression. So all of the updates uh, on a per character basis are constant time. Now, we evaluated two such algorithms. And one of them is prediction by partial matching. Uh, I don't know how, how familiar you are, you are with these algorithms. <coughs> OK. Um, and prediction by partial matching is, has been a favorite in, in the data compression community for the last two decades or so. Uh, but we also evaluate a newer algorithm that's uh, called context tree weighting. Um, this algorithm is um, also interesting, and it has some very nice uh, theoretical pro properties. Uh, I'm, al I'm only going to talk about prediction by partial matching, though, because it's, uh, it's simpler, it's faster, and it also tended to outperform context tree weighting in all our experiments, as well as the track evaluation. So um, it's also easier to explain. <coughs> so just to give you an idea of how prediction by partial matching works, um, an order k PPM algorithm will use the longest context up to this order k to predict the next character in a sequence. Um, now, the longest context means that the, lo the longest context for which some statistics are available from the training data. It simply uses the relative frequency of, of characters in this context as their probability. And since the relative frequency of many characters will be 0, it tackles this problem in a way that's very similar to uh, back-off models that are used in natural language processing. It introduces this virtual escape symbol that is basically used to accumulate some pr probability of mass that will be distributed according to a lower order model to achieve smoothing. And this is applied recursively until a non-zero probability is, is observed uh, for all uh, possible characters. Can you go back a little bit about compression? So I just sure. curious. I remember understanding yeah. the text compression, the, you know, the earliest uh, techniques of compound coding, and then you move to zip type of code. OK, so, so if this is, related to this is related to, for example, Huffman coding. Um, what you need to do for, for a Huffman code is, is to be able to assign a probability to each possible symbol. And what this does is that um, it, it assigns a possibility to each, a probability to each possible symbol, but it assigns the probability using a Marco model. So the probability of the next symbol depends on its context so on so the so previous characters. Um, you, you actually. In, in, Sorry. So I th well, uh, let me summarize this in terms that I think might make sense to this audience. Because the, the, this, uh, so it turns out that the compression community and the language modeling community kind of, that you're familiar with probably ended up doing very similar stuff. So th this is what this is equivalent to a character engram model, and you think of this as just a particular kind of way to smooth character engram models. Uh, and the fact that ha the fact that happens to have been done by the compression community is related to compression only through through Shannon's theorems and not 
That's not. So don't, don't think of it as compression. Think of it as aggregate line inclusion modeling. Perhaps that's the best. Is that it's limited to say trigrams, but you're going to use much longer sequences when you can. That's true. Um, so, so, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep that in mind. But anyway, I mean, in, in most of these compression algorithms, you'd have just two subsystems. One of them would be um, the language model, basically, and the other one would be the encoder that does the conversion into bits. So, and what we're really interested in is this source modeling um, subsystem of, of a typical uh, data so compression algorithm. No, no. Lampel-Zeev is a is a totally um, in in data compression. You you basically well you have at least two types of algorithms. One of them are statistical, uh, which we used, and they use probability, and uh, you can use arithmetic coding or Huffman coding to convert that into into actual bit representations. And the other techniques are dictionary techniques, such as Lampel-Zeev or ZIP, that just have a dictionary and store references back into the dictionary to achieve compression, but they have nothing to do with, with, with what so we were doing. With the probability modeling techniques, yes. the problem is that you may have a mismatch between the statistical model that you've built and the text that you're encoding right now. Well, of course, you'll always, your model will, that's true, yes. Um, um, what statistical data compression models do, actually, is that they start with an empty model when they start compressing a particular piece of text. And then they build that model, update it after each character is encoded, um, to sort of um, so in the hope that they're, they're able to build a model that approximates the information source well. So you're so. building the model from the text that you're going to compress. Exactly. You don't have a model that is built on some you, you can use a primed model, which would be what you're, what you're talking about. So often people would prime a model on, on maybe a, a corpus of English text if they know that they'll be compressing um, English text, for example. But th they'll usually continue updating the model as the text is being compressed. Is that clear? Okay. So, okay, prediction by partial matching uses what would the natural language modeling be a back-off model, I think. Um, Josh will know more about this. And it, it simply reserves some probability mass um, for the back off or for this escape symbol. It's called an escape mechanism in data compression. And um, this um, reserved probability mass is distributed according to a lower order model. So basically, a higher order model is smoothed with a, a simpler uh, lower order model as a, a sort of prior. And there's quite a number of variants of this. Uh, algorithm out there. And um, they differ mainly in the way in the heuristic that's used to estimate this uh, escape probability. And we use PPM method D, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, and um, in combination with what's called the exclusion principle, which I'm also going to talk about. So PPMD is really simple. I think it, it, it's very, very similar to absolute discounting in natural language modeling. Basically, the first occurrence of each character in a given context is discounted by one half. So it's only considered as one half of an occurrence. And all the probability mass that we gain with these discounts is uh, used for, for the escape symbol uh, or for the escape mechanism. And this probability mass here, it is distributed among all characters uh, according to a lower order model. And the exclusion principle basically states that uh, the escape probability should only be distributed among those characters that do not appear in the higher order context or that have a relative frequency of zero. Question? Yes. What, what is SPA in your formula? Oh, uh, that's from the previous example. Sorry. Um, if text that we, we're, we're trying to predict or that we're working on is here are the results of our experiments for the track spam track, and the character that we're predicting is M with the context being SPA, uh, and we're using an order three model. Um, this continues here. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's a character-based language model rather than the word based Exactly. <coughs> OK, so um, data compression models can be applied to text classification in a pretty straightforward way. And this has actually been proposed by a a couple of people before, although it's not very widely used for text classification. So what you do is you build one compression model from all of the training documents of each class. And um, 
you evaluate your target document using each of these compression models uh, by processing the, the text of the document from left to right per character. And um, once you've accumulated the, the, these probabilities, uh, you use them uh, just using Bayes' rule as, as an estimate of the conditional probability of the document given the class. Uh, so you, you simply have a Bayesian text classifier, um, although that's just that it's not entirely naive. Uh, now, during the course of our preliminary experiments, we experimented with, with quite a number of modifications of this original approach. And one of them that seemed to work very well was to simply allow the model to adapt to the text while the target is being evaluated. So after each character is, is being is, has been evaluated, the model updates its statistics. And uh, the benefit of this would be that it discounts redundant evidence that favors classification to a particular class. And, and this example hopefully depicts this behavior. Uh, suppose we have a, a um, hypothetical document that has uh, just six pieces of evidence and three of them point towards the green class, three of them point towards the red class, and all of them with an equal weight. Now in this case, a static model, not allowing the model to adapt during classification, will say that both classes are equally likely. But if we allow the, the model to adapt, it will realize that the second occurrence of the word casino is actually redundant. So it would discount its effect on classification and select the green class in this case. Um, in our technical report, we actually um, consider this uh, from a theoretical point of view. And it turns out that you're actually estimating a whole different classification criteria, one of minimal information gain. So the idea is, if you add the target document to each of the classes, how much new information will the target document bring to the description of each of the classes? And you, s and you select the class for which this additional information is minimal. You use the character-based Yes. Program. Yes. Is it true that most of this engram has already been captured by dictionary? If you do have a dictionary, that contains probably more information than um, the engram you have. No, you actually train the well. You train the engram models on, on on the training data. You use all documents of a certain class to train a uh, a model, and you use the, you do this for each class. So why character-based engram rather than word-based engram? Uh, I'm probably going to get to that that in, in the results section, just to to give you an idea. So, so I'm very confused by, by this section. So you're going to, is, 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 well, first let me, be, it, is this, this is a tip you actually found was helpful to? Yes, this? very helpful, actually. And are you going to talk more about it in a minute or try to uh, Not really, except okay. the results. So, um, so what you're saying, so on a document by document level, you're going to do the update, and you're either going to one class or the other class? Well, that, that's true. I mean, you, you're going to update, update one class or the other class, but but if I, I'll, I'll try to explain this ag again. Um, we build one model for each class, one one character level engram model, and then you use this these models, for example, one for ham and one for spam, to evaluate your target document to see um, which one of the models deems the target more probable. Now, what you can do is that what you're evaluating your target document in sequence per character, right? And what you can do is that you can allow the model, update the model after each character is processed. And what happens here is that consider uh, using the model built on the training documents of the green class. Now, under the hypothesis that this document belongs to the green class, class the word casino will seem very surprising to the model, the first occurrence of this word. But since we, we'll update the model as the message is being processed, the next occurrence of the world will not seem this surprising, will not have such a low probability under the green model. And therefore, its, its, its effect on classification will be discounted. Is so, so you're going to update things more that would have had, it's saying an update of one count at a time, you're going to do a larger update if? if no, actually, we, we update the models with, with each character. We, we continue updating the models as the message is being processed. So you're going to so you'll update the model exactly following the PM? Exactly. Uh, th this is the same kind of thing that would be done in a data compression sorry, algorithm. Sorry, sorry. So, so, does, does, so does this 
Are you saying you don't use PPMD? Does this change how you do the evaluation, or does this change how you... This doesn't change the update. It changes how you do the evaluation? It changes how you do the evaluation on the target document. I see. Okay, so instead of using just the probability of the target document, you're going to... Actually, you do use the probability of the target document, but while you're evaluating the target document, you, you, pro you, you evaluate the pro probability per character. Right, so, so you evaluate the target, you so process it from left to right. Okay, so instead of using the, so you're going to wait the doc, you're going to wait the probabilities of each document, you're going to wait the probabilities of each character in the document based on how surprising it was in some sense, rather than, rather than being them all equal weight? Well, that's what you do um, in, in base anyway, so, I so mean, is it's... This different than, is this different or is this the same? Is this just another way that you do what you... What no, it's actually quite different. So the idea here is, for example, consider a multinomial naive base. Um, now, usually in a, in a multinomial naive base, you'd, you'd do a big product of all of the probabilities of, of the words occurring in the document. And each of the, each of the words uh, will appear in the product as many times as it appears in the document. Now, consider. Um, Consider splitting the document by words, but keeping the order of the words intact. And consider accumulating this big product of probabilities just from left to right um, while you're, this is what I call processing the document. And now consider that after each of these word probabilities is, is evaluated, included in the product, you'll update the statistics of the model. Um, you'd, you'd simply increment the, the statistical counters for that word. That means that if you, if you encounter a word twice, um, the next occurrence, the probability of the next occurrence of this word will actually be different than the first one. Right. And this is what we do here, just at on character level. Okay, so you're just using a PPMD model, and you're just, say, you're just saying it's important to do the update exactly. as you're processing the document. Actually, document. everybody that tried PPM before um, assumed that it would be better to keep the model static when you're evaluating the target. So maybe I didn't make this, this clear. I it is silly, actually, in a way. Um, no, but this is huge. So you're doing this for two, so let's say you have a spam model and a not spam model. Yes. You're updating the statistics for both. Now, do exactly. You pull them out again? Yeah, you pull them out after you see, um, in the track evaluation, you'd be communicated the gold standard after you've done the cl classification, so you'd have to pull one of them out um, after you know which class the document belongs to. Please. Is it fair to think of this as adapting the language model. Exactly. It, it, that's why it's, okay, we, we so call it adapting. When people do language model adaptation, at least in the world uh, of n-grams at the word level, um, it's a big deal uh, to weigh the amount of data, right? Like if you have a lot of training data that you built your original models on, and then you see a sentence that has 10 words, it's unfair to think that you're going to adapt anything, unless you're really careful at how you weigh the data that you see in the new, uh, you know, the I understand. Well, here I think that. Do you take any provision in that direction? No, I think that, that this is actually accounted for in a very natural way, since um, the original model that you're updating is built on the entire training data set. Now, if that data set would be very large, the updates um, that are simply increments of the counters uh, that are done while evaluating the target will be comparatively very small. But if you have a, a a small model built on a s small amount of takes, this might actually have a big impact uh, on the actual model. Right. Um, so um, it's, it solves itself pretty naturally. And one more question. Uh, people have been using screen training for uh, building classification models, including n models. Yes. Well, this is a generative model. So. Of I'm sure there's plenty of room for improvement here. You could you could use this. Um, you can train a discriminative model on, on on this representation certainly, or you can probably even devise a kernel that for an SVM. No. Do you have any results to uh, indicate whether or not this essentially yeah. adaptive mechanism allows you to reduce your training set? Uh, no. Uh, well. No, maybe some some speculation, but I, I, I can talk about it if you if you want it when I get to the results. So uh, I've just finished with the method. So if there is any more questions, maybe now is the time so to ask. The concept of compression of assigning fewer codes for high probability. Exactly. Yeah. Do 
you use that, that concept here? Well, implicitly we do. Well, there's um, no code sorry? There's no code. You don't want to have minimum length. No, we don't do, we don't do the encoding stuff. We, we just do the probability estimation. So OK, to summarize, we model text as a, as a sequence of characters using micro models. And we use statistical data compression algorithms for this because they're practically designed for this task. Um, we evaluated two such algorithms. And for classification, you build one compression model for the documents of each class and then simply use them as base classifiers. And we've experimented with allowing the model to adapt while it's evaluating the target or, or, or keeping it static. So the evaluation, um, I'm going to get to the results in a minute, is really revolves around the, uh, this year's spam track at the Text Retrieval Conference. And this was the first year that the uh, spam track was actually held. And its goal was, uh, quote, to provide a standard evaluation of current and proposed spam filtering approaches. Uh, the results of the track were a, a, a standard evaluation methodology, including measures that are used to, to rank the filters. Um, and a process for evaluating spam filters, as well as a software toolkit that implements this uh, testing process. Also a product of the, of the track was a collection of uh, both public and private corpora uh, that were used for the evaluation. So the actual filter evaluation is um, something that you would probably consider online learning. So each mes the messages in the data set are ordered by their time of arrival or receive date. And each of the messages is presented to the classifier in sequence. The classifier must produce a binary judgment, whether it's ham or spam, as well as a score that's meant to indicate its confidence, uh, the classifier's confidence in its prediction. Um, this is repeated until the whole data set is exhausted. And the filters that were submitted, we actually had to su submit um, uh, binary code that implements the filters, uh, had to implement uh, a common interface that the, the toolkit would use in, in order to evaluate the filters. And the reason for this is that there were a number of private corpora. So instead of um, sending the data to the, to the filters, they, uh, we had to send the filters to the data. And the evaluation was done by the track coordinates. So these are the performance measures that um, were used in track. Uh, so they used the, the Hammond's classification rate and Spammer's classification rate, which are standard measures, but there's always a trade-off between the two, as I'm sure you'd know. So the main measure that was um, really uh, used was the area under the rock curve, because it captures the behavior of the filters at all different filtering thresholds. And actually, all of the results that we report are in, expressed in the area above the rock curve, simply because the filters do rather well, and it's much harder to see the differences in the area above the curve if all of them are at 99% or 99.5. Can you explain ham? Oh, ham is the opposite of spam. Uh, <laughs> so it's a legitimate email. I'm missing something in the methodology. Classify them, trade. You're given a bunch of messages that are labeled to learn from. Yes, but you, you hide the label from, from the classifier. It has to predict the label. After that, immediately after predicting the label, uh, the classifier uh, learns what the true label is. So it's as if you would simulate this perfect user that always tells the classifier when it um, made a, a mistake. Uh, uh. And normally, I mean, for single point performance, you know, measure, they just take the uh, equal error point. How does that differ? Uh, um, it differs here that, that, that the filters were allowed to, to choose the filtering threshold by, them, by themselves. So you could actually, I don't know, optimize uh, the spam misclassification rate at 0.1% false positives or something like that. And, and this is why. But this really wasn't used much um, in the evaluation. Uh, I mean, all of the results practically that I'm going to show you are in the ROC area. <coughs> Please. Was the data run in, in, in one order? Or was it shuffled? In no, it was always in, in, in time sequence. So it was always ordered by the time uh, the messages arrived uh, to, to simulate real email usage. So you weren't given an offline set just to train on it. This whole thing. Is no, you actually started with an empty model. Okay. So the first classification you had to m make was just wild guess. So, uh. so somehow, I mean, the, the idea is that in the real world, somebody's actually classifying for you as they receive these messages. Spam or not spam? Well, the idea here is that you start with um, a new email user that doesn't have a single email message. Yeah. So um, there was no pre-training. Of course, you could you could build 
a, a training set into your classifier if you wanted. Um, so you could send a pre-classified model. But it's a bit risky because maybe the data won't, won't really match what you see on, on the test collection. So we used an empty model. So the, the first classification was 0.5% probability ham. Do any participants actually have a model? Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think that um, in our initial experiments, we experimented the spam assassin, which uses a sort of combination of different techniques. And they also have some heuristics that are hard-coded in there. So you can consider that a pre-trained model. So I'm, I'm still a little confused. Is this supervised or unsupervised? That is, after you make each decision. You oh, yeah. You, you, you after, after you make each decision, there's a train command that tells you what's the gold standard judgment. So, oh, wow. uh, and the train command doesn't lie? No. Yeah, that, that's a, it simulates <laughs> a, a perfect user. So. Oh, this is very unrealistic. Well, it is, but it's probably more realistic than, than most of the evaluations that are published most of the time that use, for example, cross-validation, also with perfect feedback. So. Yeah, if you have a user that's uh, disabled, so I think it's a spam, I think it's a spam, it's incentive is to get it right. It's the user that's doing the training, the late one. And that's my understanding. And also, on, on the other hand, all the judgments we've ever seen is a certain percentage yeah, absolutely. error, and it's, it's non-trivial. Non but, 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 but I think that, that this is naturally also included in this evaluation, because most of the core pro were actually, uh, the, the, the private core pro were private email of the track coordinators and volunteers, and they probably also make the same kind of mistakes, maybe less so. Than, than your typical user. So this would actually be implicitly included in the data set. Um, and how many unrated examples do you have? No. None. 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 Okay, that's, Th that's the way the evaluation was, was <laughs> conceived. So um, well, I, I didn't. I understand. Those are the rules. Of yeah. The um. <clears throat> so OK, the, the official evaluation was done on four corpora. One of them uh, is a public corpus that will be made available probably around February. Um, it's built from the Enron data um, that was released after that, uh, the big Enron scandal and the investigation. So that was uh, very <laughs> handy. And there's also three private corpora um, on which the, the, the filters were tested. And to create a final ranking, uh, something had to be done to create a final ranking of the filters that didn't always we didn't always win on all data sets, uh, is what I'm trying to say. So what they did is uh, the organizer created this aggregate corpus that basically includes all of the email um, ordered again by, by time of arrival if, as if it was one very huge mailbox with um, 300,000 messages. Um, finally, there's another data set that's unofficial, but I'm going to report some results from it. Uh, because we used this data set for our initial experiments and some follow-up experiments. It's the spam assassin corpus. I, know, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's basically a, a collection of messages that um, has been provided by the spam assassin group uh, for text classification. And it was all also adapted for the software toolkit by the uh, organizers of, of the uh, track evaluation. <coughs> So just to give you an idea of the kind of participants at TREC, there were 11 groups. And each group was uh, allowed to submit up to four filters. So I think there were um, something in the range of 44 filters that were uh, competing. Usually, this would just be different uh, configurations of the, of the same filter, but not always. Um, there were actually two open source filters. That was CRM114 uh, and a filter submitted by Laird Brayer, who's the author of DBACL. So I, I think that would probably be the, be the filter that was evaluated here. And there was also one commercial filter a spam guru that's developed by IBM Research. And then there was a number of uh, uh, academic institutions that um, submitted their own implementations. So we also submitted four filters. And um, uh, we, the, the configurations that we submitted mainly were to evaluate the effect of the order of the Ngram model on classification performance and how PPM compares to the other compression algorithms that were um, that we developed or that we implemented. So um, I'm not going to show you these results. They're pretty uninteresting. They both perform practically identically. Um, PPM is usually slightly better. <coughs> uh, as for the implementation, the only thing I'd really like to point out is that uh, we used virtually no email-specific pre-processing. We only did MIME decoding and stripped all non-textual attachments. So, question. so they gave you the training data and no. 
No, you had to send this to the filters to, to so they ran all these yes, they ran all the experiments on the private corpora. This is why you actually had to implement the, the comp um, interface uh, so that they could just plug it into their, their uh, toolkit that was used for evaluation. The training data were provided by them. Yes, of course, but they were kept private. So you, you sent the filter and you got back the results. The training data is the test data. Really. The training data is the test data, just that it's presented in sequence to the classifier. Yeah. <coughs> OK, so next, the results are sort of in, in uh, three groups of results that I'm going to present. And um, one of them only focuses on our, uh, our own implementation, and that is um, the, the comparison between compression algorithms. I already told you about that. And um, what's the effect of using an adaptive versus a, a static model um, for evaluating the target? And what's the effect of varying the order of the compression model on classification performance? Um, then I'm going to show a couple of slides uh, comparing um, PPM to um, some open source filters and uh, some of the results of the official evaluation. And finally, time permitting, I'm going to show you some uh, follow-up experiments that we did to try to explain why this method should work well in general. Oops. Skip this one. Oh. Sorry about that. <coughs> so um, these are receiver operator characteristic um, curves. Um, the spam misclassification rate is plotted against the ham misclassification rate on different filtering thresholds. Um, and this is for the TREC public corpus, which is the Enron data set. That's this one and the spam assassin corpus that we use for our internal um, evaluation, which is uh, this one. And both of these scales are log scale. I, I should probably uh, point out because it's very hard to see the differences if you don't lose, use a log scale here. And a really interesting pattern emerges here. Uh, the red line is an adaptive model in both cases. And it, it turns out that it tends to perform much better at the extreme ends of the curve. Well, at the middle of the curve, it's virtually the same. So if you were optimizing accuracy, um, it probably wouldn't make any difference. But if you're optimizing accuracy at a spe specific false positive rate, it seems to make a huge difference. And to show you the actual numbers, here's the area above the rock curve. So a lower number is a better number, comparing both of these approaches. And it turns out that the area above the curve for an adaptive method is about one third of the area above the curve for keeping the model static. So the conclusion here that um, if the cost of misclassification is imbalanced, as is definitely the, the case in spam filtering, it really makes sense to use an uh, adaptive model. Question. This area is normalized to one? So yes. Okay. So um, this is like, uh, this is 99.65% of the, of the area under the curve. <coughs> Uh, this is 1 minus the area in, in percentage points. So, so the ROC curve contains 99.6% yes. of, of the whole area. Of the square. Yes. Square. Yes. But, but a lot of filters achieve that because if you have a, a classification accuracy of 99%, for example, um, I think that the area under the curve will probably be, um, well, will be very high in general. What's the power probability of average in the, in the data? One half. Well, at least we use one half. Oh, in the data, uh, there were some statistics about that here. Um, so, for example, for these two data sets, that's the public corpus, about, about balanced, and the spam assassin corpus, there's a lot more ham than spam. Is that realistic, actually? Well, these data sets are definitely realistic. They're actually private email by some people. And... Um, as for the rest, I can't say. There was a time, I think, when there's more spam than that. So Mr. X is a victim there. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so. <laughs> so, OK. Uh, this is where I was. <laughs> okay. So do people know, I mean, do you notice? I, I, it's hard for me to tell whether I would notice the difference between those, like 0 0.36 and 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Whatever the difference is. Well, if you look at the difference in terms of, of classification performance, um, for example, if you, if you want the 
Hamlin's classification rate to be 0.01%. So you lose every 10,000th message. Um, the spam misclassification rate for an adaptive model would be, um, actually, the curve goes a bit further. I know, I know by heart that it would be around 15 or 20 percent. So you'd, you'd, every fifth email uh, that was spam would come through the filter. But if you, for the um, static model, it will ob obviously drop off to about zero. So it would practically misclassify every spam message if you wanted to lose only every 10,000th. Uh, legitimate email. Um, so there's a huge difference here at the extreme ends of the curve. That's what I'm trying to say. <coughs> okay, so this graph here um, evaluates how the order of the engram model or the compression model affects performance. And it turns out that it's pretty robust to the choice of order. Um, the differences here, the lines correspond to the different data sets. Um, it's all, in, again, in the area under the rock curve, so a lower number is a better number. And it turns out that the differences between data sets are actually much larger than the differences between various parameter settings. Sorry. Yes? Uh, when you build, you said you have a variable order in the rank graph, depending on whether you receive the content. Yes, the order here is the maximum order that the variable order model uses. So it, it's, a, it's a limit on, on the variable it's not order. Oh, uh, no, no. It's, it's the maximum order that you would consider. Sorry. Do we have some information about how fast this classifier is, like how many megabytes per, megabit per second? Uh, could I get to that, at, at okay. maybe at the end of the talk? Or, um, OK, I, I, sure, I can tell you. Um, it's about one second per message for training and classification um, combination, something like that. And in terms of memory consumption, we limited the, the model to use no more than 500 megabytes of RAM. And this limit is, is um, reached after processing about 20,000 training messages. Um, but you can prune the model then. Uh, so how, do you, how do you prune? Like, how do you use LRU pruning, or how do you prune the model? We simply discarded half of the data, the older part. <coughs> So, so do you have speculation as to how the order affect the performance? Is yeah, because this is exactly it. <laughs> uh, so do you think Before I was interrupted, I was getting to this. Okay, so like six, uh, you know, six, uh, six yeah. characters roughly six. across the average word length or something? Um, I don't know, but I can tell you that um, the conclusion here is that varying the order is, does not have such a strong effect on performance. I mean the difference in performance among the data sets is larger than this parameter. And the other thing is that uh, an order of six model seems to perform well. But this really corresponds well to findings in the data compression community. They know that um, using an order of five or order of six model usually tends to perform best in terms of data compression. So it probably is able to predict the next character um, pretty well. This is specific for English or other languages? Do they have this is for English. So maybe for other languages it would be different. You can use such a model on Japanese, for example, which is also very handy. So, so one problem I have with measuring the order in this way is that you can just have one, this one concept that happens very rarely, and it goes up to 10 characters in length, right? It happened once, so you have 10 characters for sure. your model. But really, if you were to take the, the hit ratio, the hit rate of that engram, you only saw it once. But, 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 but Jeffrey, I'm sorry. Or char order six character engrams, right? That's that's the length of one word, right? Right. You're gonna have it, uh, excellent. So you're saying that this is well correlated with uh, with making the expectation of this? Uh, it's, it's gonna be the, yeah, it's gonna be close. I mean, you you, you will usually have seen every word before, right? This is yeah. there's no smooth and easy way. Of course, there's a smoothing issue. Yeah, I was talking about that, at the, but, but, but that's not, whole. It's, but it's not it's not gonna be as serious because the these. These are not particularly high-order engrams, so you should typically have seen most of the, the character sequences before. So do you have a dictionary available for the words that somehow also give you dependencies you know, across the, uh, you know, the characters? Well, the engram model doesn't. Yeah, I mean, the engram model is trained on the training data, and this is what, exactly what, what the engram model does. It, it predicts the next character, so it sees how it's related to the context of that character. Um, I hope that I hope that's. Um, 
Starting with a blank model, how long does it take for this to get pretty good? I'll get to that. <laughs> so here's a comparison. Um, uh, the first comparison that we did, well, this was done before the official evaluation, and it compares an adaptive order 6 PPM to a number of open source spam filters on the spam assassin data set. So these are the rock curves here, and the red curve is, is uh, PPM. So it's conveniently located at the top for, for the most part. Um, but on, on some parts, like uh, this one, uh, spam assassin does better. But we, we suspect that this is because it's spam assassin is pre-trained. And there's some differences here as well. But in, all in all, in the area above the curve, it beats all other um, open source filter. It's closely followed by Bogo filter, and, and the rest are, are quite a lot uh, worse. And this is the result of the official evaluation on the so-called aggregate corpus. Uh, so this is the rock curve, uh, spam misclassification versus ham misclassification. Um, and again, the red line is uh, the system that we submitted. Again, an order 6 PPM model here. Um, it actually performs best on most of the curve, except there's this small point here uh, where it's unperformed by, outperformed by CRM 114. And um, this difference is not that large, because we're, we've got a log scale here. So the difference might be 0.3% uh, in, in misclassification or something like that, if we're keeping the ham misclassification rate fixed. And um, just to give you an idea of some numbers, for example, if we, if we set the threshold really high, so that we'd only lose every 10,000th legitimate email, um, this would filter out 80% um, of all spam. So every fifth message we'd get. And these are results for, for three other filters that were best in, in, in this measure. And the rest were, were close to 100% um, misclassification. And this is the results for the same four filters. Uh, that's these, these four here. Um, at another um, threshold where we lose every 1,000 legitimate email. And here, actually, CRM outperforms marginally uh, prediction by partial matching. It can be seen in the curve here as well. Um, but the other um, algorithms are, again, uh, worse. Now, this is um, what, what, what um, you were getting at. Um, how fast do these methods learn? Now, this is the learning curve in terms of the area uh, above the rock curve. Um, with respect to how many messages uh, have been evaluated by the classifier. So it's the, it's the area above the rock curve, if, for example, the data set would only contain 50,000 messages, or 1,000 would be here somewhere. So the, the messages, it's all of them, they r learn really fast. Um, because the area above the curve would reach 99, well, the area under the curve would reach 99% very soon. It's hard to tell from this scale, so really soon. And uh, the red line, again, is, uh, is an order 6 PPM model. Yeah. Which are the, what's the, it looks like the purple and yellow are yeah. learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have no idea. It's um, the IBM system uh, is this one, uh, the purple one. It had, it was doing, you know, rather well here, and then it had some sort of problem. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> And, and the yellow one is also interesting because it's, it's started to do spectacularly after the first 500 or 1,000 messages. But then this deteriorated. So this was, this was a filter submitted by York University. And again, I don't know what the reason for this would be. Um, is there a disclosure as to what goes into each algorithm when they submit this? Um, usually there is, but um, um, there, there were only three speaker slots at, at the um, at the session. So um, I only learned about the IBM system and the CRM system. So it's not like they're published somewhere. I think they should be. They should be published in the proceedings. Be, yeah. Right now, they're not. right now they're not yet. But the proceedings will be out in about February. CRM one of four is a little on that, so <coughs> and we should we should mention while we're showing the small but not quite as good results of CRM one fourteen that we have one of the, the authors of the CRM show address of the one of the co authors of the CRM one fourteen. Uh, publication. So huh. hopefully we'll get to hear some more okay. about that at a later point. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, this is the um, learning curve. So um, I hope this answers your your question. And again, at the end of the evaluation, um, the PPM model outperforms the others quite substantially. Although it should be noted that again, this is a log scale 
So the difference here is much, much larger than the difference here. <coughs> now finally, I don't, I don't know if I have time for this because um, this has been pretty interactive. So um, these are some experiments that turn out to be very interesting and, and they go a long way in, in explaining why uh, a compression model should work well. Um, and what we did is basically that we took the spam assassin corpus and we added random noise to it to simulate the sort of obfuscation tactics used by spammers. And we varied the amount of noise. So 20% noise means that about every um, fifth character will be flipped randomly. And we experimented with two versions of the data set. One with the non-textual headers, which is sort of realistic. The spammer can only change the subject and, and the body. And the other one, just to study the effect that noise has, was uh, in, in the other data set, we stripped all the non-textual headers uh, from the messages. And these are the results in the area above the curve again. A low number is a better number. And PPM is compared to BOGO filter, which is uh, a tokenization-based filter that happened to perform best in, in our uh, initial experiments. And you can see that the effect is much smaller on PPM than it is on BOGO filter. And especially if we remove the non-textual headers, which can otherwise still be used by the filter to produce reasonable results, this effect is really amplified. So this performance here is actually pretty bad. Um, and even when we distort 20% of all messages, the area above the curve is still better than many open source filters on the non-distorted data set. So <coughs> it's pretty interesting. And now finally, uh, I'll, I'll be done in about five minutes. Um, we, we did a visualization of the classifier just to see what are the kind of features that the classifier finds. And this was actually designed more like a, as a debug tool than anything else. So what we did is we used this magical formula that converts the log odds of the character being spam into an RGB color value. And a red colored cal character indicates spam, green indicates ham. So these are two typical examples. Um, Legitimate messages would be colored in a prevailingly green color, and spam would be colored prevailingly red. And there's some parts that are simply neutral. Um, and here's a couple of, of, of um, enlargements uh, to show you what, what are the typical kind of patterns that we found interesting. For example, here's an obfuscated URL in a spam message. Um, it's pr picked up pretty nicely. And notice that the uh, prefix and the domain suffix are both considered quite neutral. They're colored in a gray color here. Um, also, the classifier seems to pick up the typical character substitutions used by spammers. So an at sign for spelling Viagra seems very spammy. And there's also certain patterns in, in, in legitimate email that are picked up by the classifier. For example, the greater than sign following a new line, which is typical in forwarded messages, really rarely occurs in spam. So it's always colored with a bright green color. So OK, I'm going to conclude with this. Um, so. Our conclusion would be that compression algorithms seem very well suited for spam filtering. We did achieve first place in the FREC evaluation. And the reason for this, we believe, is that they're very robust to noise. So actually, the fact that many of the messages are um, obfuscated may have actually helped us in the evaluation. And they also include punctuation and non-textual patterns in a very natural way in the model. It turns out that allowing the model to adapt while evaluating the target seems to be ve beneficial. And um, finally, I'd like to point out that um, these algorithms are very efficient. They're all linear in the amount of uh, data, both for training and for testing, and that they are incrementally updatable. So uh, if you have an online learning-based system based on user feedback, um, this is very desirable. Let's get this. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And um, if there are any more questions, welcome. <coughs> Starting with an empty sort of model, I mean, you you kind of asymptote around 50,000 messages, which is quite a bit. Yes. Uh, so <coughs> it, be better? it probably would be yes, but um, we we didn't have any training data. We could have shipped the spam assassin corpus with the filters, but but then there's a risk that after those 50,000 messages, that training data would hurt you. I mean, I'm sure that there's plenty of room for improvement here, but it, we really wanted to study the algorithm more more than than the sort of so of all these other methods that were submitted there, uh, was there any that used standard classification? Like I know you take a low linear model or a maximum metric 
model and you just actually putting all these features that you have in your ngram models in in those models uh, did anybody try that um well, the filters are quite different, and I, I really don't know what, what um, people were submitting um, all over. You'd, you'd probably have to look at the proceedings and, and ask us the, the track coordinator. But I can tell you that the best performing system, uh, the second best performing system, I think, was CRM114. And this one uses um, word bigrams, and it uses a WinNow algorithm, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with it. Um, or, or another version that they, that they submitted that uses naive base on, on these um, word bigrams. And also, the bigrams are sparse, so there's certain patterns that are used and, and so on. And some of the systems used uh, classifier combinations and all that as well, like the IBM system. Um, so use a number of different models and combine them. Yeah, adding to that, Chairman Four actually submitted, uh, used two algorithms. One submitted was Markov random, based on Markov, Markov random field model. Another another one was based on, was an adaptive model like him, but it, it used Winolum, and both of these algorithms used word pairs. Uh, actually, they took a window of word five, of sliding window of length five, and then they split and generated all pairs and combinations of words within that window. And uh, one of the hack in sliding window was they took bigrams, so they took all the combinations between that window, so one and five, two and five. Like that. So what would happen if you use words instead of characters? You know, in well, your, I mean, for those words which are not coming. I think I think that it would be better than naive base. It would be basically relaxing the independence assumption made in naive base. But I think that it would be worse than than using a character level model, at least for spam, not necessarily for no, for I text. No, because spam there are a lot of you know. Yes, exactly. Characters. There are probably more than 70% of the content are legitimate words. Yes. Um, so, so, so those words you use Well, but that's basically, if, if I'm not mistaken, this is something that it's done by CRM, right? Yeah. They use a Marco model for, on words. Uh, so. Well, I, I you, uh, sorry. And, you know, we really wanted to, to try this character-based approach because we knew that, you know, there'd be a lot of... Um, established system in, in the evaluation, and we really didn't want to compete with those, uh, with their same representation. We actually best with the window of five, adding to that thing. Oh, okay. uh, with four it works, with six it was worse. Five is some magic number. Five words together. But wouldn't you say that spammers, uh, like I would think that me as a sender of regular email, I try to keep it within the English standards. I don't want to have typos in there. Uh, I don't want to mess it up, whereas the spammer has every incentive, right? So I think this would be a powerful feature is, you know, how, how much of the text is in vocabulary? And I have a long list of words that are English words. And that doesn't seem to be captured in, in this letter-based model. You know, this is going to pick that up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that was the examples that, that I was showing you. So you think it was still this kind of feature? Actually, I think that this actually helped us. I mean, the fact that they distort messages. Please. So um, I think with the red-green visualization and a couple of those yeah. experiments there, you did a great job of demonstrating that your proposed method is robust to the kinds of attacks the bad guys are currently using to beat the spam filters that are currently out there. Yes. But we're in an arms war, okay? If your method was to be adopted, the bad guys would start to attack your method, okay? And what I'm afraid of is that the red-green visualization describes both the strengths and the weaknesses. I mean, it, if if the bad guys had those tools, I'm sure they could come up with something to get around these methods. And well, I'm not even sure they need these these tools in order to reverse engineer those basic assessments. I mean, what I'm thinking about is, would there be some kind of a good word attack that I could hit you with, if um right, um, if I knew what the good words were, and it probably isn't that hard to figure out what they are by just Blasting set of messages and seeing which ones get through. That's right. true. I, I I agree. I think that the fact that um, Bayes classifiers, as they call them, have made a, a significant impact onto what spam looks like today, actually helped us here. So I'm not denying it. You know, the fact that they actually use an at sign to spell Viagra may confuse a basic filter sometimes, but it helped us. So what what just just composing a spam message that uses normal text 
would probably make it much harder for the compression method um, than it is uh, using yeah, such obfuscated messages. Work in some way where the where the good guys would share their labels, then I would think that the good guys collab using collaborative filtering could perhaps keep up with the bad guys in this arms race. As long as your method would learn whatever the new tricks were um, from any labeling of a lot massive audience, do you know what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, I. And so I agree. I, I'm wondering if there's some way to extend what you've done into a collaborative filtering framework, where the good guys could agree to share stuff that probably wouldn't invade their privacy too badly. Ah, so that's that's um, a question. Yeah. Let, let. But even even collaborative the way oh, what you know is exactly what you say it's a warfare. Well, I understand, but if there's more good guys than bad guys, no. then yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't agree. The fact is that no matter what, if you extend to a bunch of guys collecting information or whatever, the point is that it's it's temporal temporarily affected. So it doesn't matter how much. You well, there's an arm race. We're always in this race. But, no, but, but Ken, the point is, look, we have 100,000 people on Hondo helping us today. We update the filters every day. So you know what the spammers do? Every The, the good ones, right. each day they find a new attack that gets through, and then the next day they change it. I understand, but, but I'm saying now this method will actually keep up as long as... Our current, attack, our current methods currently keep up. You okay. use any machine learning technique, it automatically keeps up. But if, if we took 100,000 and made it 100 million, then maybe... It's not, no, you're, missing the point. you're missing the point. It's about the time issue. How long does it take to distribute the update? How long does it take to get the information? How long does it take to recompute the model? How long does it take to distribute the update? This method, you, you at least the update, is pretty quick. But you need the labeling. That's the, the humans need to label it, and that's the actual base to Yes. Yeah. So you need to get somebody to authoritatively label it one way or the other so you can update the view. I mean, at the very least, the updates here are um, linear. I mean, it's, it's the model is updatable. So you, need, you don't, don't need to do a whole batch of training. This doesn't diminish the, 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 the good things of the method, or it doesn't diminish the, the idea that you pointed out. It, it, everything else works. Um, it could actually even be, to some extent, probably used um, to make it easier for people to share their information. Because since you're slicing it up by characters and building this um, tree model, it might be adaptive. It depends. You definitely use, lose some of the order beyond that order six window. So the order of characters. And if, probably if you use some substitutions, it, it wouldn't be unbreakable. but. Um, it's and better than sending words to say success, I suppose. And you can detach the GII algorithms. I mean, if you detach the, the information that associates that to a particular user, it can be used, used then. Yeah. And if we could make the aggregates, you know, well, you know, loop be, instead of being days, we could make it minutes or seconds. And that might be possible in a sort of buddy system kind of arrangement where everyone shared their information instantly with people in their neighborhood and then they you, need, you need a human in the loop, Ken, and humans don't act no, instantly. No, no. Every time anyone reads any email, they would like Yeah, but the, how long do they wait between when they receive it and when they label it? On average, it's, for us, it's about a day. No, a lot of people are reading email within minutes. We do. Yeah. Well, okay, if, if, you know, if, if the first person that read it labeled it and you were able to update the model really fast, you could probably the delete the spam before people actually read it. It's, it's hard. The spammers. Well, you know, I mean, this kind of thing can be done probably automatically. Or if you, you know, if if, if you yeah, this is the discussion that I shouldn't be participating in because I don't know much about the technical details. <laughs> okay. Well, this is nice because it does make it very because it's about data. Because you know, to the extent if you could get the train data quickly. I don't have to read computer. Okay, well, here I have another question. Please. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned that you don't care about uh, code length of the model. Uh, code length? Well, so, so you have the, you said that, you know, you... Uh, ah, that it doesn't affect um, the performance that much. You don't measure. You don't care whether you have a 500 megabyte model or uh -huh. a 10 megabyte model. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and That's I agree right. that in the server-based scenario, you know, you're off mail and you want to filter, it probably doesn't matter. But if I have it on my client, I, I don't want something that's 100 megabytes big in my RAM. Especially now that you're filtering. Sure. I mean, uh, <laughs> so this will be a whole, yeah, um, I agree. 
you could, you could serialize it, um, put it on the disk, and since uh, it's linear time, if you use the hash, um, you could probably make it work pretty fast. Uh, quite very fast, actually. Just like base filters use a, a database for, for words. Um, but you can put it in main memory. Basically, we used about 500 megabytes of that, and it tends to perform very well. And we had to prune the model um, after about 20,000 messages. So I don't know what the effect of, of reducing this allowed allowance of RAM would have. I can't tell you, Do you uh, right now. Well, one thing you saw was that it plateaued fairly quickly, right? So you just certainly, yes. whatever size you're at at the plateau point would, would probably be. Ah, that's right. So maybe if, if we allocated more memory for, for the models, if, if that's what you're hinting at. No, what I'm saying, no, I'm saying no, been. no, no, no. On the, on the curve, Yes. So you hit a plateau point yeah. um, at around 50,000 messages. Yep. So if that 50,000 messages is in taking less than 500 megabytes. It's actually taking more. That's About 20,000 messages is the first right. time we had, to, we had to prune. OK. So or maybe 30 or something like that. How many engrams are in the 500 megabytes? Do you know how many statistics I, you're storing? I can't tell. I, oh, I don't know. But probably a lot. Um, but I really you don't know, know how many bytes per engram or anything? Um, I know that it's uh, 20 bytes per, per engram. Actually, exactly 20 bytes per engram, plus maybe a little bit of overhead for. So you weren't using this creative try compression methods or something. Yes, uh, we used a Patricia try. Um, so that means that um, that means that you can keep the model in size linear in, in, in the amount of data for one for one thing. So, for example, if the if the statistics were the same for a bigram and a trigram. Um, if there was only one character that precedes a certain bigram, you'd use the same node in, in the try to store it. Some yeah, there are. The other trick is to keep pointers back into the data, of course, to, to, to have the actual engram stored there and to keep everything in a hash table for fast lookups and so on. So we used all that. And you should have made a whole byte to store the character in the um, Sorry? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, I'm sure that there's, you could so probably reduce it to one half, but it wasn't really the thing that we were no, I, really interested in. That makes a big difference for the questions Josh was asking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure you could probably reduce it to a half. Um, after that, it would be pretty difficult. So the standard literature, at least for Ember models and uh, word level, for how to do pruning using entropy-based criteria, so that it doesn't hurt your predictive power. Uh, there's, uh, there's new methods that grow the language model. Essentially, you decide whether you're going to put this engram into the model or not based on how much it helps you. Uh, I don't know if that would be anything interesting in this context. I think that probably um, using the most recently used statistic would be, I mean, least recently used statistic would be just fine. I think it would be better than what we did. We did what we did is just throw away half of the training data, um, and that means that we um, we lost the statistics for some of the engrams that also occur in the second portion of the data that we still retain for training, but we removed the statistics pertaining to the first portion of the data for, for those engrams. If you know what I'm getting at. So if if we were if we were um, pruning just per engram, it would probably be better. Um, so, so are you saying that the temporal dimension is more important, like discarding things that happened a long time ago? Is, I, is I would think so, but I'm not, I'm not claiming it because we didn't try different approaches to that. So we simply discarded the old part of the data. So the language modeling, there are, there are, there are a few very effective techniques, like cache model. Is it, is it, do, do you use this kind of concept in doing adaptation? Um, I'd, I'd have to think about that. I, 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 I'm not aware of what a uh, cache model is. So. It's, it's real, what he's doing with the adaptation is related to a cache yeah, model. It's not, it's, not, it's not exactly any kind of cache I've ever seen, but it's, it's using the same intuition. So uh, in these kind of curves, if you were to take your model and after 50,000 messages, you just keep it static, uh, would performance be adversely affected? Do you have any ideas? That's a good question. That's, that's a really good question. I mean, you claimed initially that there was a big benefit for doing the online adaptation. Yeah, I think that you'd get a drop-off in performance. But I, again, I don't know. 
obviously this was the one of the full four filters uh, that we submitted for the evaluation and the one that performed best also in our initial experiments and the track coordinators just did one run um, on, on the whole data set and, and this is a private corpus I mean it contains it's an aggregate corpus that contains a lot of private data so we're really unable to, to, to do any more detailed experiments plus that it takes about a day to run one, each of these on, on the hardware that we have available. Have you done any experiments to try to understand the benefit of the online versus static with some other data set? Like um, well, we did, it, we did it on the two corpora that I showed you. Um, that was the spam assassin and the, the, the public data set that we got from, for, for Trek. But we, because we saw that the adaptive models worked better, we only submitted adaptive versions for the official evaluation. And I was just um, talking to Gordon Cormack, the, the um, track uh, coordinator, and he agreed that, that we'll be able to test um, the difference uh, for a paper that we'd like to publish uh, on the private corporate as well. It would be interesting to see if you could make a static thing, like every week do a static, a new build of a static model and run it for a week as opposed to doing it adaptive per, per instance to see if you know, what yeah, um, on, on in personal email filtering, it's not such a difference. But for server-based, probably I don't know. But if if you can, you can if you can update everything incrementally, um, the cost of the updates is just the same as the cost of the classification in computation. So it's it's really not much of a problem. So uh, there were a lot of systems submitted. Track, right? And there's this idea of survivorship bias, right? Uh, namely, we invited you because you won this competition, but it may just be, a, you know, pure luck. <laughs> no. What can I say? Uh, it's, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that we're seeing here the winner. So, 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 is there a good reason that this is the winner, or is it just luck? So, so let me comment on that, Chipper. Twenty-five systems. So, so, so uh, if, if you go look at the, the results in more detail you'll see that across the different corpora at many di and with many different ways of evaluating on the different corpora, the system is consistently the best or one of the best. So. Well, I'll take your word for it. I mean, it's not, it's not a nagging question. It's not. It's I mean, you can. It's, 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 there's, a, there's, there's a definitely a consistency to, to how well this system worked. Um, CRM 114 also is consistently good. So these across, you know, these, they're, they're I, I don't think that's a particular. There, there are some other issues with this, right? The, the adaptive nature of it, probably. I think a lot of this data tended to be more biased towards um, plain text than. I'm just guessing. Guessing it's more biased towards plain text than the kinds of stuff we see at, say, Hotmail. But in terms of whether this is a real result, I, I would think I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. I don't know. It's, it's the largest. Publicly disclosed evaluation to date. So, so any your other systems? Sorry. You submitted four systems. Well, yes, but they were just different parameter settings of, of the same methods. So you expected this one. To work. Yeah, we expected it. it. It also worked best in in, in our preliminary uh, runs. So any tests of uh, Hotmail spam filter or similar tests? Just just one one thing um, about the question you asked. Also, for for all the other participants, um, this is actually. The last number is the ID of the filter that they submitted. Also, the best filter over all data sets is, is, is shown. Uh, so we didn't you know, give ourselves. Uh, on, these are actually the official results. So for each, each um, competing um, group, the best filter overall was selected, and all the reports are reported for that filter. Well, you know this game where the broker calls you and says, this stock is going to go up. And then he calls another guy and he says, this, this stock is going to go down. Give me $10,000. He always wins, right? <laughs> yeah, this is not quite this repeated. So I mean, this is a one-shot <laughs> thing. So it's not right. the same story. Right. I don't know. <laughs> no, that, that was my question. Thank you. No. Great. Well, let's thank the speaker once again. I'm, I'm